we got three or four. People. We got three or four other people. All right, so we're gonna need some interaction. I don't. Uh, I don't like doing the whole just Zoom thing. How do I? Uh, I need to see more people. Hold on. And Casey made herself the host out there so she could let people in so you don't have to babysit that and okay. let people in if they're coming in late or anything. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, sorry, it's a little different, but uh, here's what I want everybody that's on Zoom. Um, if you will, if you guys are actually like able to watch and, and participate with a video, I'd love to be able to interact with you guys and answer any questions. Um, otherwise, I can just interact with this in the room. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, if you guys want to turn that on, that'd be great. And uh, if you want to unmute yourself, we'll, we'll just have a discussion. So today we're talking about goal setting. Um, the, this is uh, goal setting is this is a little different um, <laughs> and uncomfortable for me. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, so uh, I just usually teach students. Um, do you want to move it over here? I might end up doing that. In fact, I'm just going to do I'm just like, stuff is going. So I'm just going to set this over here and then I'm going to stand up here. Um, so, goal set. Uh, what is what, you goal set right now? I love more interaction. Mm -hmm, a little bit. Okay. A little bit. So, uh, hey, we got one. All right. Andrea, how are you? Good, good, good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, goal setting. We, I want to talk really about what goal setting should look like, how it can look, and how to be effective with your goal setting. Because most of the time when we goal set, we're goal setting more toward, um, like we set this kind of lofty goal, and a lot of times we set these aspirational goals that uh, we set at the beginning of the year and then we never revisit. We just, we set this goal, we think we want that. And then the next time we look at it is January 1st the next year, oftentimes. And that's not how goal setting is effective. Um, so one of the things that, uh, and I think the reason Brian probably invited me to do this class is uh, my wife and I actually started doing a goal setting retreat uh, annually. Well, I think two years ago was actually our first one. And we followed a model, shock, shock. Uh, and we, we set goal setting um, up as part of our annual thing. And then we revisit that and we, we set a plan in place and mile markers. And it was truly transformational for, not for our business. Um, my, my real estate business, I've been goal setting for years. However, my goal setting was like how most people goal set, which is just, you set it. And at the end of the year, you hope you achieve it. And I think that that is the trap that we fall into is we, everyone, you're not gonna find anybody that's like, yeah, goal setting is not worth it or, or isn't valuable. Um, but what makes it valuable, we miss oftentimes. And it's not the actual goal setting itself, it's having a relationship with your goals. And, uh, so rewind to 2019 was we, Hillary and I, we went down to Broken Bow. We took a couple of days, kind of unpacked what we wanted our life to look like, what our goals were, and then asked the question of how do we achieve this? And so the first thing you want to do when your goal setting is to have a Sunday goal. It doesn't even have to be a certain year. You can just have a Sunday goal. Ours, whether we want the ability to work from anywhere, anytime. So we wanted our cash flow to exceed our expenses. And we want to be able to do any of the work that we want to do with that remotely because we love to travel. And so the goal became how do we get to be able to travel where we want, when we want, and still have the income that we want. And, and so we looked at, uh, for, we set goals in every area of our life, but one of the main goals that we were focusing on that was new was our investment goals. And so we set some investment goals up for investing in real estate with a certain cash flow. 
Um, I had no idea how powerful goal setting can be with your partner. That was something that was very changing. Not, not to say you can't goal set without that, but to have somebody that's in partnership with you on this, that's going to help hold you accountable to these goals, give you somebody to like, oh yeah, we, we set this. We need to, we need to achieve this. Right. And having that, that person that holds you accountable and you hold them accountable and you're doing this together, it just makes it a lot easier because I business planned, I've business planned my real estate business for years in goal setting, uh, and never did it with my wife. And so it, when I, when we started doing it together, it would became a lot more impactful. Is your wife in real estate as well? No, no, okay. No, so she doesn't have a real estate license. She's an interior designer, so she oh, does cool. do some stuff with our team on that side of things, cool. yeah. but not not a realtor. Uh, and and I think that's why I never did it. Right? It's like it. I look at it as this is my business, and I'll set it right. And nothing wrong with that but it's not best like for me it was it, when when we came together because we not only goal set in business we goal set spiritually we goal set in what we wanted our, our family to look like and and how we're going to raise our kids we goal set um, our personal finances we goal set our investments we goal set around anything that we wanted to change and so you start with where do I want to be someday? It doesn't even have to be a, like a year from now, three years from now, five years from now. Just someday, where are you hoping to be? And then we so you start asking that question. Uh, and that can be in any area. Hey, where do we want to be spiritually someday? Where do we want our, like, what do we want our family to look like someday? What do we want our finances to look like someday? And then you backtrack and you come back to the five-year mark. And so then you said, okay, in order for me to be where I want to be someday, where do I need to be in five years? Then you backtrack and where do I want to be in a year? And that becomes your annual goal. And I think what people oftentimes do is they're like, they just ask themselves the question, where do I want to be next year? There's nothing wrong with that question. It's a great question to ask. The problem is, is if you don't have the long in mind, the short doesn't matter. Like if you're, if you don't know where you want to be someday, how do you know that a year from now, this is where, is this actually taking you to where you want to be? Uh, and it allows that filter to be a lot easier. If you, if you have a filter in place of, is this one year goal actually setting me up for success to my someday goal? Now you actually have, you know, if you're on track or not. Uh, one thing that I will say that, that we typically do just as humans is we gravely overestimate what we can do in a year and we gravely underestimate what we can do in five, uh, because you can experience exponential growth and it doesn't, that exponential growth doesn't take place in a year. It takes time. And so when you, um, I love this, when you see somebody, when you see a company uh, that, that has this kind of J curve or a business that has this J curve of success, right? And this is you know, year five. Um, you, you typically see this. What you're actually, if you zoomed in on this J curve, what you're gonna see is this. And you're gonna see that it's, it's having success and failure, having a little more success and failure, having a little more success and failure. And as you begin to do that, that's why on year one, we overestimate where we can be in year one because we just don't think that we're going to fail as often as we're going to. However, we greatly underestimate where we can be in five years because of the exponential growth that we have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the goal setting piece, I think, I, I said, have a relationship with your goals. And I heard, I'm, I'm just literally repeating this from a class that I, that I went back and we, we ended up doing our goal setting because of this class. This class that, that was at Famer Reunion, which is one of the big events that Keller Williams puts on. And um, I think it was Chris Suarez that was, that was hosting it. And he's, he talked about having a relationship with your goals. And 
what does that actually mean? It means you're going, we have a date night with our goals. So Hillary and I once a month have a date night with our goals where we look over like, hey, we wanted to be here in 12 months. Are we one twelfth of the way there? You know, are we are we doing the right things? Where are we missing? Where are we where are we uh, seeing success? Do we need to revisit our goals? And by the way, you should do that. That is something that that's a piece that most people miss is that it's okay to revisit your goals and adjust your goals accordingly. And I think a lot of people miss that. Um, Sometimes it's a conversation of, hey, we're behind in this particular area. What do we need to catch up? And sometimes it's, hey, we're behind in this particular area, and yet I'm not sure that this particular area is as important as some of these other areas. Maybe we need to adjust down in this goal so that we can focus more on these other areas. That's having a relationship with your goals. Does that make sense? So when you're just coming in and it's just like, this is it, and this is what the metric that I need to see, and I'm just gonna do this for a year. It's very difficult to, to, to actually maintain and, and achieve that. Uh, the five-year goal is really where I like to start as far as asking the question of having clarity around what I want five years from now. It's very difficult to see that well past that, if you don't believe that, look back at where you were five years ago and ask where you thought you'd be today. Like that's where you begin to realize like, oh, five years is, can change a lot. And so I think five years out is about the, the, the furthest out other than a Sunday goal that you can actually kind of visualize. And that's why most people talk about setting a five-year goal. So you can kind of have an idea, okay, I have a, a two, four and six-year-old. So I know I'm gonna have a seven, nine and 11-year-old in five years. I can visualize to a degree what that life is going to look like. What am I going to want? What are some of the troubles that I'm probably going to run into? Where do I want to live? You know, what, how do I, uh, how do I want a vacation? Do I want to take them to Disney world or do we like, you can get super clear with what you want and then start to budget toward that in different areas and then work your way backwards. And the thing that I'm going to really encourage you to do is when you're setting a five-year goal, push yourself because it is a lot more achievable to make large changes in five years than it is in a year. And we tend to think, oh, we can get all of this stuff done this year. And the truth is, is we usually bite off more than we can chew. But then when we look at our five-year goals, it's usually pretty small in comparison to what it could be. Um, I mean, five years ago, I had just moved over to KW, right? And so five years ago was my first year here. And now, fast forward five years later, which was my goal, by the way, I am mostly out of production. My agents take care of, of the day-to-day -day transactions. My admin takes care of the administrative work. And for the most part, I'm working on the business. I'm not working directly with clients anymore or in rare cases, just in those cases where um, it's past time or whatever, and I have that relationship. So all of our new clients are, are working with our agents. That was something that I want. I mean, that was part of why I moved over here is that a, that was my Sunday goal. And I'm realizing that what you can set in five years is a lot more achievable than what than you think it is. Because I would have guessed it would have taken 10 plus years for me to get to this point. Um, and when you've got intentionality and then you start tracking to that, and knowing what it's going to take for you to hit that goal it becomes a lot easier. So um, one of the things that you that, that, that I want to kind of go into is I think a lot of the times I definitely felt this way when, <laughs> when I came from my previous company, I, I really had a mindset of mindset didn't matter. That was really more of my mindset. It's like your mindset doesn't matter. Your mindset isn't going to call people. Your mindset isn't going to convert deals. Your mindset isn't gonna actually get you business. And so when people talked about having the right mindset and, and, and having those uh, goals, I always thought, hey, yeah, that's great. 
But at the end of the day, I got to get things done. And so I don't really care about my mindset as much as I care about action. Anybody, y'all fall into that? Anybody? <laughs> no, yes. Fall into action more than mindset? Yeah, you fall into this. I like because I definitely felt that. Like, where it's like my mindset is secondary to yeah. my action. And I have completely 180 that because if you don't believe you can achieve something, if you don't believe it's possible, if you don't, um, if you can't visualize something, how do you go toward it? And it really shifted my mindset greatly when I came over here and realized that mindset was most of the issue. I thought, I felt like 40 units a year was, that was what I wanted. Like I, I got into this business and I was like, how do I make $100,000 a year? That's what I want. How do I make $100,000 a year? Well, doing 35 to 40 transactions easily got me there. That was, I, and so I have this mindset that I had arrived. I had achieved what I set out to and I was there and I plateaued because of it. And, and guess what? It, because I believed that 40 a year was, was where I wanted to be because I believed that 40 a year was, was achieving success and getting me where I wanted to be. Then my actions followed my mindset. And so my mindset was, this is success. This is what I need to do. And then my actions follow. Well, all I have to do are the actions to achieve for it. Does that make sense? And so as I began to get around people that were bigger thinkers and uh, ran their business so much larger than I did, it made me go, oh my gosh, like this 40 isn't the, I was, I was big fish in a little pond. And I realized that as I, as my worldview opened up and I'm going to a conference and seeing people that do over a thousand deals a year and, you know, do over a hundred million in, in, in commissions or like in uh, volume and, and this just big picture, it made me realize that's achievable. And the second that you realize something's achievable, it becomes easier for you to believe that you can achieve it. And then your actions will follow. Um, an example that I've heard several times, and I don't remember the names of this, but there was um, there was a runner that I can't remember. Was it? The, I think it's a six minute mile is what couldn't be achieved. It was either a five minute mile or six minute mile. It was a threshold that no one had ever broken a record of running a mile in less than however many minutes. I can't remember what, or maybe it was three. I don't know. There was a threshold. It was five for a long time. I think it was shooting for four and a half. Okay. So it was five for a long time. So for the longest time, there was somebody that kept training and training and training. I cannot remember his name. I wish I could remember the, the name, but he kept training and training and training. And he would get to five minutes and two seconds, five minutes. I mean, he just, it was so close, but he couldn't break it. He kept trying, he kept trying. And this was like for years. And he was a record holder, but he wanted to break this threshold. Someone else broke that threshold. And the next week he broke it. Why is that? Because he figured out it could be done. Because he went from believing it couldn't be done to understanding that it could be done. And that, that is the difference in goal setting to a, a theoretical goal, a out there kind of a aspirational goal and goal setting to something that you can visualize, something that you can truly achieve. If you don't have a big enough mindset, you're not around big enough people. That's the answer. If you don't believe something can be done or you, or if you haven't seen the evidence to make you believe that you can achieve it for whatever reason that is, you won't achieve it. And so you're probably, I mean, 
this is that old saying, but it's so true. You're a reflection of the five people that you spend the most time with. And, and, and you can even break that down into certain areas and go, I'm, I'm going to be a reflection of five people that I spend the most time with in this area, right? And so specifically to business, if you are spending time and you are uh, and your entire network or the five people that you spend the most time with are not where you want to be and you're having a hard time getting there, you're probably spending it with the wrong people. You need to push yourself in growth. And sometimes that's being strategic in who you spend time with and who you let speak into your life. I don't know how many times as a, as a real estate agent, um, I've had people that have friends and family that they listen to, to give them real estate advice. And it's bad real estate advice. It's, it's just not accurate to today's market. And I know this because I'm a professional and I know this business, but if they are going to, have, if the client is going to spend more time with these people and have those people then have more influence and these people are leading them down a path that isn't the best, that's a path that they're most likely going to go down. There's very little that I can do to actually push someone to go past that point. Uh, because they're going to listen to the five people around them. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, visualizing the, the five-year and one-year goal takes practice. It's, it's not super easy to do. It is a skill that is developed. And I think that so many times we will find an excuse as to why we can't do something, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not a visual learner, so it's hard for me to visualize, or that's just not how my brain operates. I can't think like that. You're, you in that have already set yourself up for where you're gonna be. By, by making that comment, making that decision to believe that that's not what you can do, you made your decision, game over. You have to almost unlearn what you know. And then if I can get, if I could get everyone to, to change one hat that would lead to more success in every area of their life, I would change the habit of I can't to how can I. We give ourselves so many outs with I can't do that for for whatever reason. Are you bumping it down? Yes. You are my hero because it is warm in here and I've got cold here on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you. The, um, if you take the, take I can't out of your vocabulary, just don't even say it. Don't even allow yourself to say it. And I know that sounds so cheesy, but I'm going to tell you why this actually works because it's based in science, which is really weird that you would think that something kind of Really like this is based in science, and it is. And that is because, and I think that's why, just so for the record, until about five or six years ago, I didn't believe that mindset was that big of a deal because I just believed actions equals output, right? And, and that's a very, because it's methodical, I can see it, I know that if this equals that. The problem is our brains are wired to do certain things and we can rewire it. That is the beautiful thing about our brain is, is you are not in a static place. You're always growing and, and changing. And when you change the question or if you take the phrase, I can't out and replace it with how can I, it literally is changing the way your brain works and operates. Sounds like hocus pocus, but it's called the reticular activating system or the RAS. It's in the back of your brain. Hi, Tom. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm sorry, I'm late. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, the reticular activating system is the part of your brain in the back that uh, when you, okay, you just, you said you're, you're, you bought a new car, right? Yes. What'd you buy? Uh, don't lie. I bought a van. Okay. <laughs> like, mini yeah. Okay. A Toyota Sienna. Toyota Sienna. So since you bought that vehicle, how many times? Sienna's have you seen on the streets? All over. They're everywhere. Yeah. Did you ever notice them before? Nope. Why? 
Because I never thought I would ever own one. Okay, what do you drive? Toyota Tundra. So we got some Toyota fans in this room. They're good cars. When you bought the Toyota, Toyota Tundra, did you all of a sudden notice that like, oh my gosh, there's more Toyota Tundras on the street than there are F-150s. How did this happen? Yes. Okay, that's your reticular activating system you want to work on. Your reticular activating system is literally the filter for your brain because we are incapable of processing all of the information that is coming through to us. I mean, there is so much stimuli coming into our world that our brain has to filter it to the things that are important to us. So we get control of that. So the second that your conscious brain decided that a Toyota Sienna is something that you was important to you, all of a sudden your RAS starts filtering to say, okay, Toyota Sienna, this is important. And you start noticing this. How many times, because, okay, you've been in real estate since 19. You've been in real estate for a year and a half or so, year, something like that. You've been October. October, okay. And I know this may be a little different because of COVID. I know this has to be right with you. Have you been out to a restaurant yet where four tables over, somebody says the word real estate or realtor? And you hear it? <laughs> That's a real thing. Yeah. Why? Because you're it's listening. Important. Because you've told the subconscious yeah. part of your brain what to listen to. Mm -hmm. And so now it's going to start listening to that. When you goal set with clarity and you start asking the question, how can I, rather than I can't, it literally rewires your brain. It, because you're, now you're telling your RAS, this thing that I'm saying, how can I do this? This is important to me. And it's literally going to go to work for you trying to figure out how can I do this? Is that not the weirdest thing? Mm -hmm. It's so cool how it works. And it freaking works. Because when I say I can't, I can't sell a thousand houses a year. I can't do that. And the truth is, is I don't think that that is an easily achievable thing, right? If I say I can't do it, does my brain try to figure out how to do it? No, no you've told it what to do. You've told it it's not important to you. And we downplay it because we don't want that pressure, right? That's we we lie to ourselves a lot to take pressure off of ourselves, right? Oh, I don't have to do that. That's not that big of a deal. How many times as a kid, as a teenage kid, did you go like, I don't give a bleep, like, mm -hmm. and how many bleeps did you get? <laughs> yeah, like all of them, right? Like you cared so much about what that person thought, but you said, oh, I don't care. I don't care about that. You, you tend to, you're telling your con subconscious what to do at all times. And your conscious defines that. So we try to take pressure off of ourselves by saying, oh, I can't do that. Like somebody else can do that. Or I can't visualize well. That's, I'm not a visual learner. That's not something that's easy for me. And so we throw out there that I can't do something. And of course, our brain goes, yep, you're right. Uh, the famous quote from Henry Ford, it, you, you know, whether you think you can, you think you can, you're correct. Yep. And that is so true. Uh, it seems like we're not even really talking about goal setting, but we really are. Because at the end of the day, if you can't visualize where you need to be five years from now, and you can't visualize the clay with clarity where you want to be a year from now, it's very hard to goal set. Then it's numbers on paper. And when was the last time you had a relationship with numbers and paper? You just don't do that. You don't. College? I needed to pass that algebra class. Right. You, just, you don't have a, a relationship with it in the sense that this is a this is something that I'm going to achieve. This is something I'm going to set out. This is something I'm going to revisit on a regular basis. If it's just numbers and papers on a board or on a piece of paper. Um, by the way, writing your goals down is I don't remember the exact um, numbers. You're far more likely to reach your goals when you write them down. Now, when you write them down, you're telling your, the reason that works is you're telling your subconscious that this is somewhat important to me, right? And so as you're writing it down, you're not, you're processing it in a handful of ways, which is telling your brain, this is how this is going to work, right? Um, if I just said at the beginning of the year, I want to lose 30 pounds, right? And that was the end of that goal setting. Okay, I'm going to lose 30 pounds this year. I can do this, right? If I write that down, 
I've now said it, thought it, now I've written it down and I've seen it, right? And so, and I'm seeing it being written out. So your, your brain is, is reinforcing that this is even more important. That's why that works. However, what's even more effective than writing it down, this is where people stop. And most experts are gonna say, uh, you know, set a goal and write it down. And that, that's kind of where they stop. They're like, be sure to write your goals down. Now, go on a date with your goals once a month. That is where now it's going, now you're telling your brain how important this is. Because it's not just a one-time thing, but now I'm revisiting it. Now I'm also able to adjust because how many, how many of us went through some changes between uh, February and April of 2020? <laughs> a few, like a couple of changes? Just a few. Just a few. Uh, so would it have been important for me to adjust my goals based off the environmental changes. Yes. And I think that sometimes we think that goals should be this chisel it in stone and put it in the ground and that's my goal. That's not the way our brains work because here's what's gonna happen is either that goal is gonna become unachievable or it's gonna be obsolete. Shifts happen, right? Things change. And, and then we're gonna avoid the goal, right? Never look at it again. Well, no, because now it's a reminder of a failure or it's a reminder of something that can't be achieved. And now, instead of confronting this, I'm going to avoid it. How many of us avoid pain? Most of us in the room? Yeah. yeah. So we, we avoid conflict. And we avoid conflict with ourselves, most of all. Like, we don't want to be reminded of our failures. We'd love, we'd love to just shift those under the covers and go, ah, and we kind of write it off like, oh, that, that goal wasn't that big of a deal, right? And then we don't achieve it, right? Oh, I lost five pounds. That was good. That was better than, than not losing five pounds, right? And so we, we tend to then shy away from our goals. If you have a relationship with your goal and, and, and you're, you're visiting it on a regular basis, and this is an ever-evolving thing, all you're doing is saying that I have something I want to achieve. How do I get to it? That's all goal setting is, is it's being intentional about the place that you want to be. And so when you uh, can clearly set a, it means five years is hard to have real clear visualization uh, because there can be a lot of changes, but that's usually the extent of what visualizing things can be. And you can get to a pretty clear basis and that can shift a little bit. I mean, I, I once, visualize our team uh, being at, uh, there is a, the old Burger King off of uh, mm -hmm. Ed Noble Parkway. Mm -hmm. It's this two-story building, it had, a, a, had the slide in it. One of my core values is fun. I love to have like a, I, I want fun on our team. And I drove by that and it was abandoned building for years. And I was like, I want my team in that building. I started visualizing my team being in that building. And now it's Chilinos, so I don't know that that's gonna work out. You can still go in that room. But, <laughs> well, I mean, this is the thing, it's like, your vision can change. I was still visualizing a certain number of people in that place doing a certain number of deals. Maybe the place shifts, but the vision doesn't. It, it, or the vision shifts, it doesn't just go obsolete. When it goes obsolete is when you have it chiseled in stone and you're not revisiting it. Because then that's not an achievable goal and we avoid it. Make sense? Okay. So um, what are some ways that I'm going to, if people on Zoom want to jump in and say something, I really want to be more interactive. What are, some, what are some things that we've goal set in the past? Where have you goal set? Where have you seen success with goal setting? Where have you maybe not seen as much success in goal setting with goal What about, I haven't, I've done it once. What about like those vision boards that the uh -huh. office loves to do? So the vision board is simply a tool for envisioning, right? Like it is just another way that you're able to visualize. I think that that can be, I personally haven't done it. Um, and that could be a, a detriment, but I'm a little less of a visual person in that sense. Like I, uh, I like to kind of list my, I'm more of an auditory learner. And so like having things in more of a bullet point, 
actually makes more sense to me than a lot of visual things. Hillary, though, is the opposite. So I think a vision board would be really great for, for Hillary. And truth be told, it would be helpful for me. I just haven't done it. That's just being honest. So the, the bucket list kind of concept is goal set. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now it is okay. So that is a someday goal, right? So you're setting your someday goal. So before I die, I want to X, Y, and Z, right? How many people achieve their bucket lists? Not very many. Why? They didn't have enough time. They didn't revisit. They didn't revisit. It. They didn't ever revisit. It never became a priority to them. They never told their brain how important it was. Maybe it wasn't important, which is just a self awareness check, right? There's a lot of things that I aspire to be that at the end of the day, I'm probably not going to be. Like. I, I aspire to have chiseled abs. I don't like the pain of going to the gym enough to want chiseled abs. So that's just a reality check for myself, right? I need to be healthy. I, I, have, I can make some better life decisions to be healthier. And yet I know I'm not going to go through the, that's not where I'm willing to go through the pain. I think that's a self-awareness check. And so it probably shouldn't be on my bucket list or my goal list to have chiseled abs. I'm not going to do it because then I'm going to avoid it. Right. Uh, and I think it's having a relationship and going, okay, someday I want X, Y, and Z. Like, think back to five years ago where you were, what your life looked like, and think about how much has shifted and changed in your life since then, priorities wise. Right. Like, we tend to think that we're staff, that, uh, when you ask people, when you pull people uh, and ask them, how much have you changed in the last five years or a set period of time? And then ask them, how much do you think you'll change over the next, in that same period of time? Most people think that they won't change a whole lot over the next five years, but they'll tell you that I've changed a lot in the last five years. Because we have this static mind, like we have this mindset that, oh, where we are is where we're gonna be. That's just not the case. We're constantly moving and changing, and our goals have to as well. Because maybe it was a priority for me to go uh, climb Mount Everest one day, and now my priority shifted to raising three kids, right? Like, that's okay. And not to say it'd be good to be both, but maybe I'm choosing to not. That's what I'm, what I'm saying have a relationship with girls. Don't let this be chiseled in stone. It's X, Y, and Z. And hopefully in five years, I'll get it. And what I'm probably going to do is look back at my notes from five years ago and go, oh, I didn't. You <laughs> think that that's what most people said to you. So um, what are some other, anybody, have you, have you, anybody in here set goals before and achieved them? Whatever that might be. Yeah, what was it? Get my real estate license and change my career. Okay. And how long, I'm curious, how long out was that? When when did you get the visualization of or the desire to change? February of last year. So it's safe to say that five years ago, being in real estate wasn't on your radar. Not at all. Yeah, that, a year ago. Right. So when last February, so a year now. Right. And so so when that happens, should you have a ring like if you if you had a five-year goal two years ago, should that five-year goal shift now as your career has shifted, as your success has shifted, sure. like where you're, like, that's the important piece. And that's the piece that, in my opinion, I was, I felt misled on for a very long time. It's like, oh, you need to set this goal. I and mean, you need to just walk out and try to mm -hmm. achieve that goal. What I found, like, I, I, the bucket list was a significant thing in my life. I created a bucket list. 12 years ago. Okay. And then I wrote it down and I stuck it on a column on the side of my computer screen. Okay. So I look at my computer visualize. screen every day, all day. Now I stare at my bucket list all okay. day, every day. Right. And that helped me start ticking some things off. Then I came to a conclusion. I'm not going to be able to do a whole bunch of stuff on my bucket list doing what I'm doing in my life. Okay. And so changing the real estate allowed that. Is going to allow me to achieve more of my bucket list. Okay. And that is awesome. And that's being intentional about your goal setting, right? Like, 
This is the other piece too, is, is the intentionality behind it and the practicality behind it. Because you may have a vision board up in front of you, right? With a, with a Peloton on it that you want one day. But if you're not gonna be willing to do whatever it takes to spend, I don't know, four grand or five grand on, on a Peloton, right? Mm -hmm. Then are you actually gonna achieve it or is that just on your vision board because it's pretty, right? Yeah. So being intentional with your goals and being real with yourself. Because again, there are aspirational goals and then there are the real goals. These aspirational goals are things that we, what that really means is we think that this should be important to us, but it's not. And I'm going to put it on there. We do that a lot. We will think, uh, I mean, let's say our industry. They, we will say, uh, how, you know, I want this many deals in a year, right? Where did that come from? Is it, is it more of an internal drive or is it more of an external drive? Did that come from, I see other people that are successful that do a hundred deals a year and I equate success to doing a hundred dollars or hundred deals a year. And so I think that my goal should be to do a hundred deals a year because that's how most people goal set. That's an external driver. When push comes to shove, what's gonna happen? Is your internal driver gonna take over or your external driver gonna take over? Internal. 100% of the time. Whatever is truly most important to you is what you'll prioritize. And if traveling 30 weeks a year is more important in your mind, in your internal driver, than doing 100 deals a year, what is your brain actively searching out? Your opportunities to travel. To travel, not opportunities to do 100 deals a year because you're real... That's, that was an external goal. And we do this all the time in every facet. Uh, it, can be, it, it can be weight loss. It could be financial. It's we equate what success looks like based off of external factors. And then we create a goal around that. But if it's not really what your drive is toward, you're not going to be able to have that. It's not going to work, right? We're going to find reasons for it not to. And so just being self-aware enough and asking the question of like, why do I do this, right? Self-awareness, uh, I'm, reading, uh, I'm reading a book uh, called The Subtle Art of Not Giving Up. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things he talks about is, is self-awareness is like an onion. You have to like, you have the self-awareness. Some, sometimes people don't even have this, but I feel this way, right? That is a self-awareness, right? And so a lot of people stop at, I feel this way. And then they don't go, well, why do I feel this way? And that's the second layer. The second layer is like, okay, what, what is it that is causing me to feel this way? And then the third layer of self-awareness is your values. And this is where without intentionality, you almost never get to. And an example that he gives in this book is his, he was frustrated with his brother because they didn't, that he would call or text his brother and his brother never called and texted him. Well, self-awareness is I feel frustrated. That's layer one. Layer two is I feel frustrated because I don't have the relationship I think I should have with my brother. That's the why. But the real reason, the core, is my values believe that family is important and the way I, and a relationship with my brother is important. And I determine success by frequency of communication. Right. So you went from I feel this way to this is why I feel this way to this is the real core of what I believe. And then it's more of a question of, OK, should I feel frustrated? Because maybe my brother also finds value in it, but he maybe he might have the metric of a relationship is we don't fight. Right. Like that might be how his brother interprets a successful relationship with a family member while he determines it through frequency of communication or whatever else. I'm getting a little off track here, but this is 
the, these are the internal drivers and those internal drivers are going to dictate your success with your goals far more than setting an external driver. And I, so this is why it's so important. Like, um, some classes, you know, when in school said, it's like, okay, set your goal. And I'd be like, okay, scratch it out. and like, double it. I'm like, okay, well you just, I, okay. The thought process behind that is you're going to push, right? My counter argument to that is you're going to avoid. Right, because I just said something that I didn't believe was achievable based off an external driver. And then you just double it. And then I double it, <laughs> right? Because I probably, let's be real, I probably saw the person next to me put a hundred down, and I'm like, gosh, probably not. And then they told me to scratch it out and put two hundred. I'm like, well, that's not achievable. <laughs> you lost, right? If you've yeah. already, the game is already over. You, your your goal setting has already failed. If you truly believe, like, I don't know that I can achieve that. So when you have this, like figure out what your internal drivers are and you start to process those internal drivers and you start to really uh, goal set to the, the internal driver. And then you ask the question, how do I achieve? And that's how you goal set. Does that make sense? It's not this external force. It's not this number. It is, what is it? And so, okay, a great example is, <laughs> I last year said, I want more investment properties. That's like kind of the layer one. That was the, the kind of more external piece. Where it starts to get powerful is when I ask, why do I want these investment properties? Well, because I believe that investment properties can lead me to having more time. And I really want more freedom of time. So then it became, so then it went from this, uh, I want investment properties to I want freedom of time. What does freedom of time look like? What do I need to achieve to have freedom of time? Then that brought me to, well, I want my passive income to exceed my monthly expenses. That actually became the real goal. So when you have a goal, of I want five investment properties. Is that a deep rooted, powerful goal? Or is that more of a shallow external driver? When you understand that what I'm really seeking to achieve is freedom of time, and the way I achieve that is by having passive income that exceeds my expenses. And then I can go, I need five properties to do that. Then this five properties, it's not an external driver. It's not because I'm comparing myself to somebody else down the street and, and feeling like this is what success looks like. It is driven by that internal core. It's a tool to achieve the internal drive. And then this is what I'm going to goal set to, right? But it's not because I want five rental properties. It's because I want freedom of time. Mm -hmm. And when you attach it to that core value or that belief, the real driver now you can, now that motivation is there because it's not I'm motivated to go buy five properties. It's that I'm motivated to have my freedom of time. What do I have to do to get that? And it changes that, that belief, that power, that, that internal driver kicks in, your RAS kicks in. And now you're starting, dude, you start like, when you, it's amazing to me, the opportunities, wow, I just put <laughs> It's amazing to me the opportunities that, that I started to see, that I've been in real estate investing since 2008. I've been doing it, I've been doing probably five flips a year since 2013. I've been looking for good deals. But when I really have this internal driver, I started looking for other opportunities. And that's when I switched to Airbnb. And because the because it wasn't about a number of investments, it was about freedom of time and freedom of, of being able to work where I want, how I want, where I want. And that opened it up. And in a year, I achieved that goal. Like that was something that was, when I was telling you that we did the, the goal setting with, Hill, with my wife Hillary, like that's what we did. It was like, okay, how do we get this passive, this much passive income? 
well, we work our way backwards. We can do this many Airbnbs at this much cash flow, and if it rents out at this, like, and then we we get a couple, and it's like, oh, this is working, and this is how much we can make off each one. This is how many we need, right? And it shifts that drive line. Uh, this this last year, uh, to kind of give you an example of the flexibility piece, um, we went in November. We set several goals up, and I think we it, it wasn't as powerful. I'm just this is being real vulnerable. Um, we we walked away with, from there going, yeah, that was a great goal setting, but it didn't have that same like itch that that like I'm going to do this, mm -hmm. and it was more of like, well, we did this last year. Why don't we do it again, right? And then we recently kind of revisited and we're like, you know what? That's not what we want. Like it's actually more important to us to start paying down some debts uh, on the properties that we already have. Like we, you know, the mortgages, we would rather start paying more of that down than exponential growth this year. So we're still growing, but we've just, we've pivoted because we were planning on doing uh, at least four more holds for the buying holds for this year. And we decided, no, we're actually going to increase our flips instead of our holds because like my driver, my internal driver shifted. Mm -hmm. And now what I want more than uh, four additional rental properties is to have more access to cash because I think there's going to be a shift coming in about a year and a half, two years. And so for me, it's like, okay, I want to be prepared. My five-year vision changed as, as my vision of the future changed. And as I'm looking forward to five years from now, I think that there's going to be a lot of really great deals had in three years. Um, I could be dead wrong. Don't make any uh, business decisions on my <laughs> visualization. Okay. But in my head, that's what I think is going to happen. I, I look at where we are right now as 2004. I think we're going to have another 2005 and then we're going to have a 2006 and seven. I mean, I could be dead wrong, but that's what I'm thinking. And so for that reason, my values switch because I want to prepare to be able to buy more during that time. So I want to pay down these debts to be able to leverage more. Mm -hmm. So if I were to chisel my goal in stone and not revisit it, I would be half-assing mm -hmm. this vision that I don't really care for anymore, that isn't my internal driver anymore because I set it back in November. And so I'm just now I'm just going to do it for the sake of doing it, and that kind of becomes more of a grind, right? When it's tied to that that internal driver, and now I have like, oh, this has shifted. Let me shift my goals with it. That that's how a relationship with your goals should happen. I have five minutes. Is that right? Okay. Um, in, okay. So let's just open it up. What questions do you have? Lots. <laughs> no, it's just a lot. Of Do you think that having, um, like a mini timelines within your year, like a due date? Yeah, you think that is absolutely. So those are called mile markers. So when I, um, and I'm sorry because I just briefly touched on it, but what I talked about with my wife and I having a date night once a, a month. That's what that is. We're looking at that mile marker. And if you don't have somebody to do that with, do it on your own. Literally put it in your schedule and go, I want to revisit my goals for an hour. And it, sh it, it takes a little while because if you're, if you're goal setting to every area of your life, you have several things that you're going through right now. Like uh, when we goal set to potty training our kids at a certain point, mm -hmm. like, I mean, it can be kind of these mundane things. Like we, we, we were like, okay, we want, Kaius to be reading at this level and we want Riker to be fully potty trained and we want Abby to be potty trained during the day. Like that, that was one of our personal goals. And, uh, you know, how much hope giving, we have a giving goal. Like, and so, hey, have we given this much? Okay, if we haven't given this much, do we, is it because we haven't earned enough? Like, because we typically tie that to a percentage. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that was, that is that monthly kind of milestone. And what the easiest thing to do, and if you want to break that down even further, Keller Williams breaks that down really well with the 411. Um, and this is a great way to have a relationship with your goals is the 411. And you can just get on, 
get off of Google for a while, you can find a, a PDF version of this. But this is the four things that you want. To, so there's four weeks, one month, one year. So your one year goal is here, which is based off your five year goal, right? We're setting that, which the five year goal is based off the Sunday goal. Someday I want to check all these things off my bucket list. Five years from now, I want to check these three items off my bucket list. This year, I want to check this item off my bucket list. Okay, that was on that. But in business, it's like uh, I, I run mine off my numbers off units. My goal for this year, we are having a revisit to our goals. Uh, right now, we're revisiting our goals at 125. Uh, 125 units closed. So then I ask myself this month, how many do I need to, to do? How many, how many closings do we need to have this month? And then you break that down and you go, okay, how many do I need to have this week? And then what you can create, so what this allows you to do is create a gap. So if I know that I want 125, but I've only sold, let's say, let's say, I, you know, these runners, I want to, I'm at 100, it's May and I sold 30. Well, I have 70 that I need to, to achieve between May and December. Now I'm going to adjust my monthly goals, which is going to adjust my, my weekly goals. And then it may, you know, breaks down to, okay, I need to put two things under contract this week. Well, let's say I only put one thing under contract. This is, now I know that I have a gap of the next week I need to put three. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to really kind of break that down into that weekly thing. Um, this is just a tool. The bigger part here is the mindset and having that accountability to, to what we do a monthly, Hillary and I, but on our team, like with, we do weekly goal setting with our team members too. So, um, and so then that, that's the four, right? But that's a lot for Hillary and I to revisit everything now. Does that answer that question? Yes. Thank you. Are those realistic numbers? 125? For me? Uh huh. For your team? Yeah. Uh, it's a, a, so we're tracking to be at like in the 115 range because yeah. uh, there is a bell curve to the year, sure. whether we like it or not. It's true. And, and, and real estate coaches will kind of freak out if you're trying to bell curve it because they're like, oh no, you don't want to see some out of your business just break down. Like, nah, there's a, there's a practicality to this. and. June, I'm going to sell twice as many houses that I am in January, if not more. No doubt. So uh, there is a seasonality there. Interestingly enough, when you're calculating your seasonality, you can Google all these metrics. But the, what? Okay, what would you think uh, the best four months are? June, July, and August. Okay. And maybe May, June, July, and August. Close. June is number one, which is contracts are pending in, in May, right? So May is the most active. Since this is a trick question, I'm going to throw out May and say December. You're dead right. <laughs> December is the fourth busiest month of the year. And one of the reasons that that is, is you see a more cash transactions during that time, it's a lot of tax money. Getting in there. But you'll see, uh, we always see, and, and it's so fun, my business follows like national averages. But you'll see June is usually your biggest. Uh, July, I think, is second. And then we actually see August drop off, and then September pop up, and then December pops up. And I think that's because August, everyone's kind of transitioning back into schools and things like that. And so, And then they're kind of this normality comes back, and then it's holidays. But uh, you're getting I mean, December is the exception to that. So, so when you did this and you did the 125, that comes down to 2.5 closings a week, right? Yeah. And so then did you go, okay, to generate 2.5 closings a week, my team needs to be and work back. Up oh, yeah. Months. Oh, by the way, as a real estate, uh, as real estate is probably the only industry where we mostly track a lagging indicator. Okay. Just from a business standpoint, it's one of the few places no other industry that I'm aware of tracks a lagging indicator. A lagging indicator is closings. We track closings. Closings are a lagging indicator. What we really need to be tracking is leads because he goes leads. So this we go back to that. Yeah. Course, right? So we go leads. We'll leave this many leads. We'll list this many appointments. This many appointments leads to this many listings or buyer sign. This many listings and buyer sign 
go to this many contracts, this many contracts because of this many closings. So, so since you're really not in production, correct? Correct. Are you managing and keeping track of everybody and those meetings? I mean, because you've got to have somebody who's doing meetings. Yes. So uh, Katie actually was our admin. Uh, she's our director of ops. She keeps track of the individual numbers. And we actually, this last week, in coaching, one on one with each one of our agents, okay, where's our gap? Like, we have a gap, and some of us have larger gaps than others. What do we got to do to get you back on track? And so it's, it's not a I can't, it's a how can we? Is there, you know, after time, I'm, I'm we're, gonna... we're, just, we're just hanging out now. Okay, right? good. Is there, I mean, as the owner of the team, mm -hmm. right, do, do, do you feel like the system is set up now, you have enough referrals and automatic business, things are coming in for you to dole out, right, to your team members. Is, is there a, like a baseline of work that exists for you that you can depend upon? Yes, uh, and that's with intentionality. Right, like when you're intentional with your database and you're reaching out to your database and, and connecting with them on a certain time, you can literally follow metrics to go this many people in the database being touched this many times, it's going to lead to this many leads, it's going to lead to this many closes. So, with each lead source, you can do that. Now, I'll be real, this is just me being raw and honest. I'm not the best at this. Like, I, we look at certain metrics and our database could be touched even better, um, but we're fortunate enough to have. 800 past clients and, and CLI that we're that we're reaching out to, and so that allows referrals and things like that. And so uh, that's that's a, that's one of the key pieces that you're doing. And we're still not doing our touches as well as we should be. It is one of our primary focuses right now. We we recently got our online. I feel like we've gotten over the last three months. We made a transition with. Uh, the company that we use for our online lead and our CRM, we've gotten all of those systems down and it is right now. Like it is, it is finally like a system that is working and working well and we've got all or 90% of the kinks worked out and it is a, a predictable thing now. Uh, and so that's what we're also working on. We've been, we've been intentional with, with uh, reaching out to our database via email, phone, text, and mail. Uh, but uh, we could be more intentional. Yeah, that is so interesting to me. I mean, to, to be able to have like 800 bird dogs and all you need to do is stay at the top of mind. What we've done fairly well is they'll use us. What we've not done well is they'll work for us. And that's because I don't think we've coached them well in what our expectation of what we want is, right? Like, I think that everyone's like, oh yeah, absolutely. And they, they use us again. We get a lot of, we get some referrals. We should be getting more. And I think it's because we're not asking for it. Right. Because okay. you would think if you have 800 bird dogs, they run into two yeah. people a year. Yes. They need to buy or sell these. Yeah. So if you're doing it perfectly, according to the MREA, if you're, if you're touching your people enough and you're staying top of mind and you're asking for referrals, you, for, for, for every 12 people in the database, you should have one of them is going to buy or sell with you, and one of them is going to send you a referral. Is what it should be. For every 12. For every 12. So I should actually be able to achieve my number based on that, and I'm not. It's not me. It's our larger lead source, but it's not. A, uh, it's not. You still have people on? Yeah, like five or six, seven. Mm -hmm. You know, that's exactly your goal. Uh, it is yeah. exactly the goal. Yeah. I mean, if your goal is 124, yeah. it's, it's 66. We actually ran our numbers, numbers that our database should be able to achieve, but it's, and the truth is, is in today's market, it's becoming a little bit, um, we're seeing fewer, we're seeing more and more people that if they found the right house, they would sell. We have, we have probably 10 to 20 listings in our database that are ready to go. If they could buy something that they, they, they're not want, they're not willing to be a buyer in this market. So they're not willing to be a seller in this market. Um, 
And that's that's just the nature of what we're dealing with right now. Which probably means I need some better objection answers. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm so good. Yeah. Happy to happy to help. Uh, if you guys need anything or have any questions, I'm all thank you. Thank Brian. you. Thanks, Taylor. That was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it, guys. I have so many questions for you. Okay. <laughs> I'll write them all down. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Great meeting, guys. Thank you. Bye. Um, so did you...